you're going to be the first landscape photographer that I've had on the podcast. They're pretty hard people to get sort of in for a podcast. Um, I think because I don't want to be rude here, but I feel like landscape photographers are very good at sticking with their own. They don't particularly like wedding photographers or portrait photographers. They're kind of their own set. And um, they're kind of like people from Cornwall in that way. Um, so <laughs> what I, to start off with, that before we get into any of the nitty gritty, we need to know who you are and um, how you got into photography. Okay, cool. So my name is Pete and I am... I wouldn't say I'm just a landscape photographer. Um, I tend to use the term adventure, um, but I do a lot of other things as well. Um, who okay. lives on the south south coast of England. Um, I can't say I was super involved in photography at an early age. You know, some of these classic sort of people's love affairs with photography that started early. Um, my family aren't particularly the most creative bunch, um, but I was always interested in, like they, they were growing up, they were quite an outdoorsy family. So I suppose I always gravitated to our holidays would always be uh, not sitting on a beach, they'd be hiking in the mountains and and doing activities like canoeing and and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. So that's sort of what what developed my love for for the outdoors. But I think when I was about, come on, I was twenty. I did a ski season, um, and I was doing it with a good friend of mine who studied photography at Portsmouth Uni, and he brought mm-hmm. two cameras two cameras with him on the ski trip. He had like a I don't even know what they were, if I'm honest, it was that long ago, but it was, he had a really expensive, super expensive DSLR that um, he wouldn't let anyone go near. And then he had another Canon camera, um, which was just like a, I think it's still a pretty good camera. Um, and essentially, he basically said, oh, if, if you want to use this whilst we're going out and around skiing and doing things like that, then, then feel free. And I had, he gave me like a 10 minute crash course in it. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing um, with it. But I, skiing is like my, my favorite thing to do. You know, nothing would come in between us and a day out of skiing. But I found that as soon as I had the camera in my hand, I was more interested in, in capturing other people skiing around, even if, you know, there's a bit of powder or, or something that normally I just ski, ski, ski. I found myself sort of drawn towards wanting to capture other people doing it. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that's, that's probably what sparked my, my interest in it initially. Um, and then when I came back from that, that was probably, I think it's 2016, and I came back about May. Uh, it's right around the time that my cousin, who is they're from New Zealand, so I've only met them twice. He did a bit of a gap year around Europe, um, yep. and he I never knew he was such a talented photographer. But he did like you know like the I don't know if you know the classic places around Europe that, that landscape and adventure people go to. He did the Dolomites, he did Iceland, he did Norway, um, and all these places. And he was meeting up with all these like amazing photographers. Um, and I was watching that and I was just thinking, God, this, this looks incredible. Like, why am I not doing that? Um, and I never really had the money to do it because I'd just done a ski season. I'd just done a bit of traveling. So I was quite poor, but eventually in, I think it was Christmas 2017, that was when I decided that I was just going to pull the trigger. Um, and I got myself a mirrorless camera. So, and then it's sort of just been a, a passion ever since that. One thing that I find interesting with um, landscape photography especially is that it's obviously quite hard to acquire the locations. It's not like uh, if you're a portrait photographer, you can contact models and kind of they almost deliver to your house. Um, when you're a street photographer, you just go outside and you photograph in, in your local town or whatever. Um, yeah. Obviously with with landscape photography, you, you can do it. I mean, you're, you're pretty well placed. You can do it where you're placed, but a lot of the bigger stuff and especially like with the internet, the way that we kind of idolize locations um at the moment i think iceland seems to be the one that's kind of ott everyone wants to go to iceland um yep how do you go about learning without the expense of you know thousands of pounds on holidays um to learn it and then get bad pictures and learn from bad pictures that cost you thousands and thousands of pounds <laughs> so i uh, obviously i live in the new forest um so my first few trips i remember i just i think i googled something like most picturesque places or you know best views in the new forest um and i would just rock up there at sunrise um nothing really planned nothing really in mind and take some just horrendous photographs <laughs> uh, when i look back on them now and then i was obviously i, I got a lightroom so i'd edit them in that and my editing was just just terrible um but i, I think it's just you go out and um the mistakes you make when you go back and look at them you sort of just correct them and slowly over time, as you compare your work to other people as well, you you just get a bit more of a grasp of, of settings and, and composition and what you're doing. Um, and I was I was working down in Bournemouth at the time in a full-time job, which um, pretty much for the most part, I, I wasn't really getting on well with. Um, so it was just like my escape was, was getting out with a camera. Um, and I was lucky enough to have the Jurassic Coast, which is 
I live in Southampton, so it's about an hour and hour and a half, I think, to, to you know, like the classic places like Dirtle Door and Old Harry's Rocks and, and things like that along the South Coast. Mm-hmm. Um, but I worked in Bournemouth, which was sort of halfway in between. So I would, I remember I'd, I'd drive down about five in the morning, I'd get up and I'd drive down to, you know, Dirtle Door. That was the first place I went to that was like a proper, you know, big, like epic landscape, I think. Yeah. Um, and then I'd, I'd take some shots there. I'd go into work, like be half asleep at work all day. And then I'd drive back to the Jurassic Coast to go somewhere for sunset. Um, and yeah, I, I just think slowly over time, uh, I think my photos just, Quite a little bit better, <laughs> but yeah. it was definitely some, definitely something that happened slowly. Um, but I was always I, because I sort of came through this these all these people on Instagram, all the people I followed were doing these amazing trips to places like Iceland and things like that. I was always drawn to to go to the the bigger landscapes rather than finding beauty in places around me and and stuff like that. I was always I felt like I had to go to these amazing places to take amazing photos, um, mm-hmm. and I think that that consumed me for the first probably two years of, of me having a camera was um, going on these big trips to amazing places and, and you can't get nice photos unless you pay all this money and go to these places. Um, so yeah, I think that's sort of how I got into it. The um, the one thing with um, landscape photography compared to any other um, form of photography that I can think of is that there's some fairly big misunderstandings about the gear that you need to do the job. Um, there's plenty of people that work with with uh, like non full frame cameras, there's people that work with medium format. There's people who work with crop. And one of the most common sort of misunderstandings is in the lenses. People just think you just buy a wide angle lens and that's it. You're you're a landscape photographer. Um, yeah. what I want to talk about is uh, I'm not really a big gearhead, but I always have to sort of go down this route to satisfy the listeners as much as anything. Um, what's your current sort of gear setup? Um, so I shoot with a Fujifilm X-T3. Um, it's a crop sensor mirrorless camera. I've only actually mm-hmm. ever shot with, with Fujifilms. I got an X-T1 two years ago. I had the X-T2 and now I've got the X-T3. Um, and I've just, obviously for all those, you can use the same glass, which is great. So I've sort of just held onto my glass as I've gone on with the, with the bodies. Um, and I started out with, like you said, I got a, what was it? I think it's a 16 mil. Um, and that was my super wide angle lens. And it was, it was an awesome prime lens, but it just didn't give me any versatility at all. I'd go mm-hmm. to all these spots. I'd go to these spots and I'd just find that I was getting very similar um, type shots. And it's only like when I really started getting into photography and, and getting a few more lenses underneath myself that I realized that um, I actually had a lot more fun with perhaps like a 7200 where you get this really nice compression with a landscape. Um, yeah. And it, you know, you, you really shows you the scale of it. Um, so yeah, I think it took me a while to to explore different lenses. But now I find that I've got, I think I've got four lenses. I've got three zooms. I've got a wide angle. I've got a twenty four seventy and a seventy two hundred, and I've got thirty five mil prime. Um, and I find I use all of them if I want. It's just because I like to get the variety of shots rather than just your super wide shots. Um, so yeah, that's what I, that's what I play around with at the moment. When you're turning up on the scene, is it the idea that you would r- sort of work through those lenses to kind of try out every possible combination with the area that you're in? Or when you turn up to a scene, do you just think, okay, this is a wide angle scene, I'm only going to go wide, or I'm only going to go long, or whatever? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I think I think I've learned to sort of just trust my eye in, in terms of what works out, but. Um, I think having the, the 2470 gives you so much flexibility um, when you do get to a scene that you can shoot at because it's a crop sensor. Yeah, it's 24. Um, you can shoot quite wide. And then if that's not working, you, you've got the, the range to sort of, you know, play about and, and figure mm-hmm. it out. But I definitely don't predetermine anything when I get to a place. Um, I like to sort of figure it out when I get there. I mean, it's, it's probably the, one of the hardest parts about what you're doing is the fact that not only are you going to turn up to a scene and it's going to be a new scene, but also so much of it is dependent on to pardon the phrase, it's dependent on God, really. You're kind of at the mercy of whatever God wants to be doing with the weather and the conditions. So does that, yeah, does that sure. make, adap- is, is adaptability a big part of what you're doing? Oh, oh massively, yeah. I think when you get into to the landscape photography, you have to be able to, I think one of the signs of a good landscape photographer is someone that can shoot in, in all weather and still come out with, with strong images. Um, mm-hmm. Like you said, you, you never know when you turn up to a spot, even with checking the weather forecast. It's, most of the time, it's just not worth checking the weather forecast. If you decide you want to go one morning, you just go. Um, and sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. Um, yeah. And I think, I think that's definitely one of the things that um, I think has helped me figure out whether photography was just a hobby or a passion was, um, you know, not just being a hobby photographer who gets a bit of a, a rush out of taking a, a nice photo on a nice morning, but 
having the sort of the desire and the drive to, to keep going back, even when you drive two hours and you get to a place and it's just like bleak overcast, uh, you're getting rained on and things like that. And you have to deal with all these sort of different variables. Um, yeah. But then still, still wanting to, to wake up the next day or go back and, and do it all again. And I think that's, that's what sort of kept me going. Um, in my time as a photographer. So one of the things that a lot of people don't know, and I'm definitely in this boat, is uh, how you go sort of pro as a, as an adventure photographer, how you go sort of freelance. Um, so having, re- I think you said you quite recently gone freelance. Yes, I, I quit. I quit my job last, I think it was in July, but um, it was, it wasn't like a quit because I was completely ready to go to go to freelance photography. It was like a, I quit my job because I can't, I can't bear to be in this office any longer. Um, and yep. photography is the only, the only thing in the last couple of years that's, you know, that's been my, um, I don't know, my get out, my, the thing that I've really enjoyed. So it was like, okay, I'm going to quit this job. I'm just going to give photography a go. I don't know what that means. I don't know what I'm doing. I had no idea about the commercial or the business side of things at all. Um, I was like, I just know photography. I like, well, I love photography. This is what I'm going to try and do. Um, so yeah, the, the transition into going freelance was, uh, a slow one. I'm still nowhere near where I want to be. Um, I'm still learning a lot every day, but I suppose that's, that's all the fun of it. And I think, I think what, seven or eight months later, I'm, I'm still chipping away, mm-hmm. but definitely the biggest thing. And the, definitely the, the thing that people don't realize is, um, like I said, you need to first figure out whether it's a hobby or a passion because it, you can turn a hobby into a passion. Um, I think. But if you don't have the drive and the determination and the fight necessary to do something for a living, then it won't happen. Um, so yeah, I think the first thing that I learned was, uh, I just, I was, I was primarily a landscape photographer back then. I think, like I said, I describe myself more as an adventure photographer now. And yeah. I was, I just, I just had this portfolio of just, just landscapes and I'm not selling prints. I'm not doing anything like that. So what, what, what sort of appeal do I have to anyone there? Um, so mm-hmm. the first thing that I think I did was, um, learn to try and to shoot people. You know, that, that is the, the essence of adventure photography is, is capturing an authentic adventure in, in the mountains or on the coast or, or wherever you are. Um, and that's what all these, the brands that I sort of like aspire to work for are doing essentially, you know, when they release these new jackets or these new clothing ranges and stuff like that, they want people, uh, showcasing them in, in an, like an authentic outdoors environment. Um, so that was the first part of my portfolio I needed to get together. So I just was constantly trying to go on these trips. I think the first big one I went to was the Dolomites. Um, and just trying to get used to shooting people, which is just for someone who's, um, I wouldn't say shy, but you know what I mean? I'm, I like being behind the lens to then mm-hmm. have pe- people in front of me and me be, me being totally in charge of what they're doing and, and things like that. That was the scariest thing, but I think you've just got to, You've always like, like I said, when you start in photography, you've, you've just got to be, you can't be scared to try new things and you've constantly got to be pushing, pushing yourself. Otherwise you will just sort of become like, um, I don't know if, if you're inspired by someone or watching someone do things like I, I'm, I follow all these adventure photographers online who are, uh, they photograph people in these amazing landscapes. I think if I just did that, um, I'd end up just being the same as them, but I think definitely yeah. with photography and like I was starting out, you have to realize that you, you just have to keep trying to pursue I don't know, everything and, and figure out what you like the most rather than just pursuing that one thing. That's actually quite interesting because it kind of mirrors uh, a question I was going to ask a little bit later on. Um, so something with landscape photography, I've, I've watched a fair bit of it on YouTube and I, I'm, I'm referring to landscape photography, not adventure, because that's kind of, you know, not everyone's doing exactly what you're doing. But generally in the landscape scene, there's a lot of um, talk of sort of re-photographing the same scene and there's nowhere new to photograph and so on. And obviously there's a mirror there with you not trying to tread the same ground in terms of the way that you're setting your business up and you're marketing yourself. So, uh, okay. So one thing I really want to know is, are are you finding that the community is particularly supportive? Are other photographers supportive of what you're doing? Have you been able to reach out to people for help or are people quite closed off? Um, I think that's the the one amazing thing that through Instagram at the moment, um, there just seems to be like a network of people and, and I've, I've recently started meeting up with a lot of them, a lot of these people who have similar interests and want to go out on these long hikes and do these cool things in the mountains. Um, and I've just found that even if, even if these people I haven't met up with, I, I chat to so many people online and they're so supportive and they, they, they offer advice so readily. Um, and I think that's where I've definitely learned the most. Like I, I never used to meet up with, um, to other photographers. I'd, I'd meet up with a couple of landscape photographers, but that was very much like we go to Dorset. And I remember this when I first started out, 
we'd go down the Dorset and we'd get our tripods out and you know you, you stand there in one spot and you've got this like one shot lined up and you're stood there for half an hour just waiting for the perfect light to get this one shot um and i think as i've slowly transitioned and got more into photography um i started going on trips with people who i suppose wanted to do these like a uh, adventures in the mountains but it was more about like lifestyle photography and and storytelling with it so not yep. just you know the amazing uh, mountain shot at the end of the hike but how did you get there? Um, all these like little intimate things. Blah, blah, blah. And I think the thing that I learned the most from was, yeah, I went on a trip to Scotland with three other guys that um, I hadn't met before. And they were all like different levels of photographers, but all like doing outdoors things. And just on that trip there, just through sort of getting to know them and sharing our experiences with commercial work and, and looking at how they worked. Like I spent two weeks there and I came back feeling that I was, you know, such a better photographer. Um, and so now I think, I think I've just made my aim to meet as many people as I can. Cause I think I learn more from hanging around with other like-minded people than I do from going out and doing it myself. So yeah, I found yeah. Instagram for all of its negatives and all of like, the bad side of it and all the likes and the engagement and all these things that people talk about, which in the grand scheme of things are pretty irrelevant. I've met some amazing people who like, who I still call friends through, through Instagram and, and everyone that I have spoken to has been super supportive. So yeah, I think there is, I think it's been a very good side of things on that. Well, the more and more I look at Instagram and the more I hear about it and people talk about the algorithms and how to, how to work in ways that you build up a bigger following if you post at certain times and so on. I'm just convinced that people have tricked themselves into thinking they understand it and they're using tips that they're getting from people that are half naked ladies who are always going to get attention on the internet. So, you know, you're not going to get the same level of audience by posting posting at nine o'clock in the morning if you're not posting the same picture as what that half naked lady is because that half naked lady is going to get likes no matter what exactly yeah and it it sort of depends how much um what you're photographing will benefit from you having a big social media following um like i know you've got your your wedding photography and your portrait work but i think obviously i don't know how how into it you are but uh, do you need a massive instagram following for for what you do or are you just quite happy doing what you do and and working behind the scenes I think that there are probably ways to benefit from me having a much bigger following. It's just so far down the list of priorities for me. I could potentially make more money from it. Uh, But I think for the amount of effort that I see people put in, the amount that you get back is very minimal. I think really for what I do, the, the, Putting money into targeted ads gets me plenty gets me plenty of turnover. Um, I generally yeah. find uh, about a two hundred percent turnaround on Facebook ads is is a bad Facebook ad. I, I tend to make my money back really easily on Facebook ads. Oh wait, you might, might just teach me about that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's um there okay. So there are a couple of little gaming systems you can do with Facebook ads because they trick you into putting money down on money, and when you do that, they just cut the the amount of people that see it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just, I just find Facebook ads are a lot simpler because I'm, I'm offering a specific thing that people specifically want at a very specific time in their life. It's not like you get, like I'm, I've been married for seven and a half years. I'm not going to suddenly need a wedding photographer like next weekend, you know? So there are specific yeah. people looking for me. Targeted ads do a lot more. Whereas for what you do, um, I'm imagining that having just a general exposure and having people generally follow you and build up a fan base is a bit different. Yes. Yeah, of course. Um, I found that I've, I've recently started doing now. I'm, I'm, I think I'm getting towards 9,000 or something followers. Um, that more work started to find me that I never really expected. And I hate to use the word, but you know, the, the influence of work that you get that, <laughs> that people, people aren't necessarily interested in your photography or the content you can produce. They're just interested in your audience and how many of them are going to engage with whatever product it is they're looking to promote, essentially. Um, and yeah. I found myself, obviously, just where I'm, I am at the start of my career, and, and sometimes it's money that I can't turn down. I found myself getting contacted, yeah, by these brands, and it's just something I never really thought about. Um, but yeah. I definitely am, gu- definitely am guilty of, at the start, putting a lot of time and a lot of effort and probably causing myself a lot of unnecessary stress by really trying to make my Instagram feed as good as it can be and, and um, spending a lot of time engaging with people. Whereas now I'm very much a, okay, I'll post, I don't know what peak time is, in the evening when it's convenient for me. I'll go on post, spend half an hour on there, commenting with a few people that um, I like to catch up with, and then that's it. I try to stay off it as much as possible and focus on other things. And I think that's what's working for me at the moment. So with what you do, do you have the problem of, um, so first of all, do, do you curate your Instagram feed so that you're only seeing stuff that kind of inspires you or is related to the work that you do? Yeah, I think so. And the majority of the people that I follow are in a similar niche. 
Um, but that's mm-hmm. definitely started to change. Like, like I said, I think quite a lot of people that I used to follow used to be, um, it's the people that inspire me who go to really like these really wild remote places. Um, like the proper yep. outdoor photographers who will do these amazing ski touring trips or winter, winter mountaineering photography, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not necessarily inspired by that, their aesthetic or style. It's just what they're doing. You know, their photos motivate me to get out. Um, whereas I think now I definitely transition towards following more people who do lifestyle photography um and whose aesthetic and style is, is sort of more like what i'm aiming to to be which is i think going slightly more towards film photography which is i've never really i've never shot with a film camera but there's just something about the colors and i don't know the texture and the grain and things in film photography which is essentially what i'm trying to recreate with my, my style at the moment so i think if you looked at my feed it would be a mixture of people in epic places doing epic things and then these lifestyle photographers who just have these feeds of you know, I, I've just got everything essentially. So you've mentioned sort of the, um, uh, the influencer side of things. What other avenue streams are there for someone doing what you're doing? So primarily, um, what I am trying to achieve in my work is, is getting outdoor campaigns. Um, mm-hmm. so, you know, these outdoor companies, like just to name some of the big ones, North Face, Patagonia, things like that, they release yep. seasonal, seasonal collections. So spring, summer, autumn, winter. Um, and normally as part of these, these releases, they will shoot campaigns, um, which will be, sometimes it will just be like a lookbook style where they're looking to shoot their whole campaign just in one location. Um, and I've done one of those before where they were just looking for like a foresty brush location. I live in the new forest, which is awesome. Um, and I was given 30 or something items of clothing from this men's collection just to shoot in a style. Um, and that's, they normally do it like a year in advance. So you don't sort of see your work being published or, or being put out there for, for a year, which is, um, quite an odd thing. Um, but then the stuff that I really want to hone in on is, uh, these companies that do their sort of like awesome winter uh, releases and they, what they send groups of people, I don't know, three or four boys and girls into the mountains, uh, with a photographer and you just capture like a, like a four or five day, like authentic adventure of them essentially using the clothing because once, whilst you're out there, you will get rain, you will get sun. So you will have like an opportunity to, to showcase all of these different items of clothing in, in the, um, well, essentially as they should be in used. So that's, I think that's what I want to do. That that's, that's what I aspire to do. Um, but yep. obviously that's, they're so, uh, like hit and miss to, to just sustain yourself from that. You need to be really, really good, really established, um, and quite, you know, just quite well known in the industry. And I'm obviously definitely not at that point yet. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about locations. You, you've mentioned, I've seen on your feed, you've got stuff um, split up into different places that you've been to. There's a couple of places that I'm fairly jealous that you've been to. Um, yeah. But of the places that you've been so far, what are your favourites? And have and uh, sort of a second part, have there been any letdowns in places that you've been? Oh, there definitely have been. Um, I'll, I'll start with my favourites, um, just because I, I can't stop talking about them. <laughs> Yeah. Um, my favorite one was definitely the, the Dolomites. So I went to the Dolomites last July. Um, and it's obviously the Dolomites, everyone knows, it's just like a mecca for, for landscape photography. It draws people from all over the world. Um, and I went there with a friend, a Finnish friend called Heike. And I've been quite lucky on some of the trips I've been on to the places. So I've been to the Floatan Islands uh, with him, to Bavaria with him, and, and down to the Dolomites. And he's got like a this dainty red a VW Transporter, um, which we sort of aptly named Cherry. And it's like 1997, but I've, essentially I can fly out to, to these places super cheap, take with me like a normally hand luggage, actually, I've got away with. And I could just use his van as accommodation. So I've been very lucky at the start of my career that I can do these like adventures that I think people sort of think, oh, you must be spending thousands to go there. I've been able to do them super yeah. cheap. But yeah, we yeah. went to the Dolomites, went to the Dolomites and uh, it's just, it's just an incredible place. We spent five days doing that and it, it actually coincided with the, the summer heat wave. I don't know if you remember last year, but Paris, yeah. like 40 or 50 degrees. Um, so we had like 35 degrees and humidity. Um, and it was just, uh, it was ridiculous. I remember just uh, some of the hikes we did, but I remember one of the things that I was disappointed about in the Dolomites was just how busy it is because the, the whole area that we were in was like a ski resort. So even in the summer, these chairlifts, like we'd, we'd be hiking for like miles into the mountains and then like you've hiked five miles, you're sort of sweating, you've reached the top of this mountain and then you look to your right and there's just some tourists jumping off a chairlift and, you know, they've just got there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They've just got there uh, through paying. I don't know how much it was. We didn't do it. So 
what we did, this is this is probably my favorite thing that we I've ever done actually still. Um we ended up hiring this this Via Ferrata equipment, which is like, you know, the Via Ferrata routes, the iron pass that they have, mm-hmm. which I think they date back to the like nineteenth century. They were used in the war for people to get across the mountains, basically. We right. we started we started looking at hiring that equipment just so um essentially you can gain access to more remote peaks um in the Dolomites. <laughs> Yeah. So we, we we got that stuff and I was like, right, if we're going to do this, then we're obviously going to do this for a sunset or a sunrise. So we get this incredible light. So we decided on uh, just a beginner route, essentially, just to sort of whet our appetite. And we did this route where if, if you've got a bit of a head for heights, you wouldn't need any safety equipment. You could have just gone up it. But we ended up at this, this viewpoint on Mount Averell, the sunset. Um and it was just like, it's one of the best views I've ever seen. Like I, I can't really explain it. I think it's just as good as it gets. But it was like, we sat out there for about two hours. Because we'd done this 100 meter rope section, there were no, there's no one else on top of this mountain. And then that sort of just like got us thinking like, oh, okay, well, we need to do, we need to do this again. Um, and then the next day after that, we found like a, a slightly longer, slightly more intimidating one. And I'm not, I'm not the most... I don't have to, like um, a rock climbing background or anything like that. And it was like this 400 mm-hmm. meter rock, 400 meter rock face. Um, Jesus. So it, was, it was just straight up and there was like laddered sections and rock climbing sections. And I think we'd already decided that we were going to camp up there overnight. Um, so we were like climbing up with these like big bag stuff with our sleeping bags and roll mats. And when we got to the top, we were like, it was just like, half the reason I go to these places, these the mountains and things, is just so you go somewhere truly wild. Um, and I just felt yep. like the whole time we were at Dolomites, like, there were people around wherever we went. And we were just on top of this mountain called Chimakadin. There was no one else around. Um, and it was, uh, it was, that was just for me, like the, the pinnacle. That's as good as it gets. And then I remember at about three, half three in the morning, um, I was I woken out of my sleeping bag just by like flashing through the sky. Um, yeah. and I like, popped, the, popped my head up and there was this massive thunderstorm and it, it was like far enough away that we couldn't hear the thunder. So I wasn't too worried about it, but it was just like, it, we looked at it, it was on the Austrian Italian border and it was like just these streaks of lightning going like as far as I could see across the sky. And I spent about an hour and a half sat in my sleeping bag with my tripod and my camera over me, taking photos of lightning over some of the, like, the most uh, incredible mountains in the Dolomites. Um, and that's, it's just, that's probably like the, whenever someone says to me, what's the best thing, you know, you've done, that's, that's the one that sort of jumps out straight away. The Dolomites was just, it was just incredible. It sounds incredible. I mean, to see something like that, that's obviously not something that someone can just pay money and, and go and see at any time. You've had kind of a, an experience that you had to go to all the trouble to get there. And then just the luck in a sense for there to be the, the lightning storm and whatnot. Yeah. But what, what about letdowns? Have you been to any locations with like really high hopes and just found it hasn't quite lived up to it? Um... Potentially, yeah. I think, I'm trying to think of a place that I think when we went to, I th- I th- there were definitely a couple of the Dolomites, some of the, you know, the mountain lakes that you go to there. And there's, mm-hmm. there's one particular one called, it's Lego de Breyers, but people call it Lego de Instagram. It's just, it's got a terrible name through. <laughs> I, I hate, I hate it when people say that, but it's just got that name through all the, the influences going there. And it, it just makes me laugh when you go to the Dolomites because we're there in our, in our hiking shoes and like, you know, like, like I'd like to say, proper equipment like we're we're prepared for these day hikes and then you just turn up at these like alpine lakes and there's people in like dresses and flip flops and and there are fedoras and things like that and you're like god what is going on so yeah there were definitely a few places in the dolomites that we we went there and it was just like a case of like oh wow so I, I, this i just I, i'm really not interested in photographing this place because it just doesn't it doesn't sit well with me but i find generally most of the places that i go to the trips that i plan i plan them quite meticulously um yeah so so like like you're saying they've been let down i don't think that would happen because it's not like i'm just rocking up and thinking oh this this, this place sounds cool let's just go there i'm like i'm yeah. looking at the spots i'm looking at where i want to go how many days i want to spend for places um so i haven't been i haven't been completely let down yet obviously sometimes you go to places and the weather just doesn't play ball but i haven't actually been let down as such by location because if i plan to go there because i want to go there then normally i know that it thinks you think it's going to be some like something decent well carrying on from what you were just talking about um, I've seen a couple of Instagram pages creep up that are um, people from Iceland who are very pissed off about the amount of tourism that is completely disregarding the the habitat, essentially, and disregarding the environment. 
um, people that are flying drones without licenses, people that are climbing up things that are fenced off and then damaging the natural environment. And people who are, like you say, I think we all know who they're, they're either influencers or more than likely just want to be influencers who are treating a trip to somewhere that's so beautiful as just an opportunity to get a couple of pictures to get some likes. And they're kind of completely disregarding the people that live there, the environment, the animals to get those pictures. You know, does that kind of stuff... I, I, I get the impression from the fact that you you do the job that you, you you do the job that you do, and the fact that you just told the story about the Dolomites. Do you ever find yourself just really hating people with, <laughs> with regard to what you're doing? Uh, yeah, definitely. There's there's um, <laughs> good people and bad people, but yeah, there's some people that give like the the whole community a bad reputation. Um, like you said, I, I would never just go to a place purely because I think. The photograph would be nice. I, I go yeah. there because it's because of the whole experience um, of being there, and and it's sort of it's not just like a. I, I do find some people, like I said, that it's almost like they have a tick sheet, and it's like, oh, I've seen the place that I have to go to to sort of like you know gain a few followers and take some nice photos. It's like okay, I've done that, and then I go to here, and then there's there's all of these places that I think um, certain people. It's like a, almost like a route that you do. Yeah. But yeah, there's there's definitely there's definitely people um who will give everyone a bad reputation. Um I just tend to be of the sort that it's like just be as respectful as you can. One, whenever I go to a place, I like to immerse myself in in that place as much as possible because I find that authenticity comes across in your photos. So getting to know yeah. locals, understanding the, the the lifestyle of the people who live there. Um that again, all that stuff is well, that's what I, I would like to come across, <laughs> uh, the authenticity in my photos. Um, and then obviously leave no trace and all those things that most people do um, and do a pretty good job of. Um, some people don't. And unfortunately, on Instagram, you don't see the behind the scenes. Um, you know, some people that you sort of follow that you might think are being respectful aren't, um, but you don't see the whole picture on Instagram. So I think you just do have to be very careful with places like that. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I just, I just think that sometimes it's a matter of respect. Um, and sometimes, I mean, I'm someone, I would never go to Iceland just purely on the basis that I'm so sick of seeing it in my feed and I'm so sick of seeing um, the same types of photographers in terms of influencers or people that are famous for famous for being photographers, even though you never really see their photos. Um, they've kind of abused that land. They've abused the um, the goodwill of the people, I think, to an extent. One thing I found quite funny was I went to... Uh, so I'm, I'm a big fan of Vegas. I love going to Vegas because from Vegas, you can travel out to the desert. You can go and see loads of national parks and stuff. And that's my idea of a relaxing holiday where I take my camera, but I'm not a photographer, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, last year I went on my own and I met up with a photographer who's uh, similar to yourself. He's uh, very much into his hiking and um, he also likes places that are hard for uh, people that are in my physical condition to reach he likes to go places that are a little bit more exciting a little bit more difficult a bit more of a challenge and it was so funny watching him uh, we went to red rock and um, it was so funny because obviously with it being america there's a car park next to every view so you can just yeah. drive up to the view take a picture and drive off and it was the one of the funniest things course. just we're just watching him like a caged lion he was so upset that he couldn't hike to these places because you could just drive to them yeah yeah it's definitely the way that um sometimes you see people putting these captions on on instagram i don't want to get sort of bitchy here but there's sometimes you see people that like there's places that i've been to and i know for a fact that they're like a very short hike from the car park and they put like these cliche captions like the harder the hike, like the better the rewards. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that was the worst one I could think of. I couldn't think of anything else there. But it, you know what I mean? You see that and you think, I I don't get a reward from a photo if, I, like you said, you, you pull up at a car park and, and get there. Sometimes it's a nice photo, but I don't look back on it with the fondness of memories because the photos that really get me and the ones that I like are ones that really like, you know, like evoke emotion, evoke like a memory and, and make remind you of, of a good time. And for me, that's a good time is putting yourself through, I don't know, like a few hours of pain um, before then you get to a spot. And then it just makes it so much better when, you know, you've put in the effort and then you get the reward of um, an amazing like photograph and, and conditions for it. So that's just, I think that's just how I work. Does it sometimes make the feedback on an image, if you get something that's kind of either dismissive or negative as feedback on your image and you've put in all that extra work to get to that point, does that ever kind of sting a bit harder? 
I can't say I've ever, ever had too much negative feedback on, on something like that. But yeah, I can imagine it would, like you said. Because sometimes people, I think, like, like, the problem is with Instagram and, and, and people saying this engagement, no one really knows the story behind the photo. If you're only posting one photo, um, and then yeah. sometimes you, you'll write a really long caption, but I, I would love to see the percentage of people that have actually read the caption um, and really yeah. care about, about the story behind it. But yeah, I think if I planned a shot and I'd spent hours going to get there and people just sort of like dismiss that um yeah i can imagine I'd, I'd be a bit irate about that so let's talk about some dream locations some places that you haven't been to that you really are going to have to go to uh to feel complete in what you're doing what's on the list oh uh, how long have we got <laughs> i got a lot of tape you can go for it <laughs> oh there there's there's too many um and oh i think number one would be Oh, this, I wouldn't be able to put them into like a specific order. Patagonia has always been one up there for me because I traveled South America, um, when I was fresh out of uni. Um, so like 21, 22. And I went out and I, this is, I wasn't really in the at the time. Um, and I just didn't realize all these amazing places that were actually there. I, I know it sounds stupid, but I just don't know in a geographical sense. So we went to Buenos Aires and we completely missed out Patagonia and it would only have been like a couple of hundred quid extra to go spend a few days there. Um, but back then I just wasn't interested in, in that, I suppose. Um, and I, I still sort of like niggles at me now. I'm like, I was like so close to an airport that would have taken me there. Um, but yeah, I think just like, uh, the, the vastness of Patagonia and, and the, the landscape and, and the animals and things like that. I think some of that somewhere I definitely want to, want to take off the list at some point. Um, somewhere like Greenland as well. Again, like quite remote, but it's just these places that aren't on the tourist route. I think. I know you said about like pe- tons of people going to Iceland, tons of people going to the Dolomites, things like that. It's because it's so accessible and right? it's so cheap to get there. And, and pe- people don't necessarily have the money to fly halfway across the world to Patagonia or, or to afford to go to Greenland. Um, so those places are, are dream places, but I think are just slightly unattainable for me right now. Um, and China and where else? New Zealand. I think China and New Zealand is definitely the place I want to go to soon because I've got family out there. Um, and I think that's somewhere, I think maybe when this is all over, actually, and, and hopefully this is over before our summer finishes, but if it's not, then I'll just go to New Zealand and enjoy their summer. <laughs> <laughs> borrow theirs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'll, I'll use that and, and sort of do my borrowed time on that. In terms of the UK, would you say that this is a good country to live in as someone that wants to take adventure photos or landscape photos? That's something that I've thought more and more about as I started out. I think, like I said, I used to look at these like, shoot like locations in the Alps and, and, uh, Lofoten and things and be like, Oh, I have to go there to take nice photos. But as I've sort of grown, I've, I've been looking more, you know, you, you appreciate more of what you've got around closer to home. And I think there's tons and tons of like of, of wild places in, in the UK. Like you can go to Brecon beacons and, and Snowdonia. I love going to Snowdonia. And I think there's tons of like, uh, routes there that, that get you off the beaten path. You don't just have to go to Snowdonia to climb Snowdon. There's actually a, a whole mountain range there to, to explore. Um, but a lot of people don't know that. And Scotland, I shamefully so in, I don't know how many years it's been. I've had a camera now. I've only done Scotland once. Um, and that is just like a mecca for there's so much there to explore. I think that could keep you busy for a while. So definitely at the moment, my, interest is in exploring around closer to home and in the UK um, rather than it is going abroad. And then I think once I'm a bit more established and maybe have a bit more money, I might start looking abroad again. What have you been doing with the downtime with this with this lockdown to sort of stay inspired? Have you been planning out trips or just working on old raw files? Yeah, a whole host of things, actually. Um, so just normally when I'm sort of busy with work, you, you only have like maybe one or two days a week to, to fit all these like normal tasks that you'd have in and, and you have to squeeze them in. But now I find myself like stretching them out over weeks. So where I normally do like a, like obviously my portfolio, my website, I must have done them about 10 times over now, um, just yeah. as I've got the time. But I've just found that I've, I've set myself a list of tasks um, and I just I just take it easy. I've got a bit of a routine where I get up in the morning, do my exercise, and then I'll do like one thing on my list per day. And then with this weather that's going on at the moment, I don't know what's happened. We've got summer early. I, I find myself just just, rela- just relaxing, actually. I'm quite, I'm quite relaxed at this time, which is, which is quite nice. It's the most ironic summer ever, really. Everyone stuck inside, and we we really could do with the bad weather to force people to stay inside, and instead we get the most glorious two weeks ever. I know, I know. It's just this. It just doesn't make any sense, does it? 
Right. So I want to ask you, uh, we're, we're coming close to the end here, but I want to kind of throw a real spanner at you and see how you uh, deal with it. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to give you three traits, uh, for a photographer and you put them in order of most to least important for what you do. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So physical fitness, technical knowledge and patience, which is the most important, which is the least. Am I allowed to say it's a combination of all three? Or is that is that not an answer? That's a disgraceful answer. I can't believe you've done this. <laughs> no, no, don't worry. I'll, I'll answer for it. So, was it physical fitness, patience, and technical knowledge? Technical knowledge. Oh, it's, it's difficult because I think different different stages. Each one means more. Um, I, I think. <laughs> uh, I mean, when you said it was a spanner, I wasn't expecting that. I I think physical fitness probably comes last because I think. Apart from some of the super remote things I've done, a lot of people could do what I do right. fairly easily. Um, then I think technical knowledge comes after that, probably because technical knowledge is, I don't know, I think once you've built up enough technical knowledge, it's something that never leaves you. But patience yep. is just, patience is a virtue and, and that is a, uh, an important thing, especially when you've got to sit out rain and, and terrible conditions and and uh, there's so many times you can get so frustrated as a photographer when things aren't working for you um and i think you just need yeah i think you definitely need the patience otherwise you know a passionate photographer will have patience and and the they will continue despite bad days and early mornings and just tons of different things so yeah i think i think definitely patience number one you sound like a tremendously positive guy which is frustrating as a fat middle-aged <laughs> pessimist. It's very hurtful to my feelings. What I want you to do, if possible, and I'm going to kind of put you on the spot again, if you, if you were to give yourself a piece of advice for when you were just sort of picking up a camera for the first time, uh, what, would you, what advice would you offer from your position now to sort of save yourself time or to improve knowledge or whatnot? Oh, that's a great question to finish on. Um, I think the, the number one piece of advice, and you, the problem is you see this advice everywhere, and unless you just take it literally and do it, People just think, oh, everyone says that. It is quite yeah. literally just just to keep on shooting. Photography is no difference to anything else. No different to anything else. You know, it takes practice and commitment to improve. Um, you know, you've just got to push past the low points and the creative blocks, um, and just carry on going. Um, and I think that's that's definitely one of the things um, that I'd say. And then two is don't be afraid to explore anything that you have like an interest in. You know, when you're first starting out. Obviously, adventure photography and landscape photography is, I think, what I'm most dialed into at the moment. But you just never know what's going to sort of spark your interest. So shoot everything and everything that you can. I think that's what I wish I'd done when I was a bit younger. Sometimes I'd turn my nose up or, like I said, I was a landscape photographer, so I wouldn't I wouldn't have any storytelling in the photos. It would just be this one location rather than how I got there. So I think, I think yeah, shoot, shoot, shoot. And don't be afraid to try new things um, and push yourself out of your comfort zone because that is essentially how you, you get anywhere in life. Brilliant. I mean, I couldn't have asked for better advice than that. Um, one thing I always do with these is make sure people know where they can find you. So could you please give me all of your social media and your website and whatnot? Yes. My Instagram is Pete underscore L. That's E double L, which is short for Elliot. Um, and my website is www.pete Elliot.com. Um, and I can't stress enough, it's E double L I O double T. <laughs> please do not forget the second T because all the way through my life, I have had that. And it's just, oh, it's just people sending emails and saying, have you not got that email yet? And I'm like, no, I haven't got it. And it's just because they've missed out the last key on my email address. It's been an absolute treat to talk to you, my friend. Thank you so much for doing this. I hope it hasn't been too arduous. No, thanks so much. That was really refreshing. You asked some awesome questions. Um, so yeah, thanks so much. Really enjoyed doing it. Hard to see.